Hello everyone, I'm Pojo, and I am, on occasion, a trash man. I like garbage, and I want to play with it all the time. There's a pretty common thing that I say about Eternal, and it goes a little something like this. There are, almost, no bad cards in Eternal, and that has to do with how we evaluate cards and how we look at them, how we measure their overall power level. And that's sort of what I wanted to talk about a little bit today. So we're going to do something akin to an Eternal Basics, but it's just going to be me talking. We're going to be discussing a little bit about potential value versus expected value. And I guess the way we're going to be doing this is by looking at Breath of Voprex. One quick thing before we start, I wanted to send a little thank you out to our current patrons, Sam Raymond, Amu the Fox, Chris Widener, Dope Lives, Tiago Acevedo, James Good, Amy Cathera, and Matthew Mason. I really appreciate basically everything you've done for the stream. Like, it's really just been delightful to have all you folks. I hope you've been enjoying the videos, and like, I just am so happy that I've been able to do this for you for the last uh, four years, I think it's been. Um, so it's just amazing having you all. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, with that, let's, let's, get, let's get into it. So, the way we typically evaluate cards is we look at them and we measure their overall power level. For example, an average 2-drop has something like 2 attack, 2 health, some relevant card text. Uh, if it has a little bit more than that, then it's usually a couple points up from what you would consider to be a powerful, a, an average 2-drop. So, like, a 2-3 is a little bit better than a 2-2, two -two. a 3-3 three -three is generally a little bit better than a... 2-3, and so on and so forth. Something like Intrepid Longhorn, which has a relevant buff, 3-3 uh, three, three stat line, it's just generally an all-around good card, and so you put it pretty high in tier lists because it's just good. It has very, very high value. Uh, you value that card higher than other two drops because it is just straight better. But most of the time, it's not really about which number is higher. Say you've got a two-drop card that deals three damage to a unit, and another two-drop card like this one that deals five damage to a unit, but only sometimes. Now, one of these cards, which is, say, a Seer, is a key card in most to all fire decks, and the other card, which is Breath of Oprex, is basically the absolute bottom rung of fire picks. Nobody wants to pick this card ever. Uh, they don't like it in draft. If you look at anyone's projected tier list, whatever the worst category is, this card's there. It's often an F minus, but that number looks really big, right? And it was designed that way for a reason. So cards have an upper and lower ceiling. They have their potential value, which is, say, the maximum possible benefit that they can get. In the case of Breath of Oprax, it's usually dealing 5 damage to a unit when you want to deal damage to a unit, and 5 damage to a player when you want to deal damage to a player. Uh, in either of those situations, Breath of Oprax is very good. They also have their expected value, which is the bare minimum the card can be expected to do under reasonable conditions. Breath of Oprax will typically deal 5 damage to a unit when you want to deal damage to the player, and 5 damage to the player when you want to deal damage to a unit, which tends to make it a very bad card because it isn't reliable, it doesn't do a lot of things that you want it to do. But most of the time, it deals damage to the opponent, which doesn't do anything for your board, doesn't provide you with any value. The card is generally a lot worse than it looks because it frequently just doesn't have any impact on the board at all, and a lot of what we measure in value is value on the board and how we advance our board state, how we improve the conditions of our board so that other cards play even better. Because if you're ahead on board, then you get to make better choices, your opponent has to make worse choices, and eventually even cards like Breath of Oprex start to look good, because when your opponent's at 5 health, they gotta take the 5 damage from Breath of Oprex. So getting ahead on board is really, really important. Breath of Oprex doesn't really help you with that, so we lower it pretty hard. Uh, 
So yeah, you could say that a card also has like a base value, like a straight floor, like the worst possible thing that it could do. But most of the time when we measure value, we're measuring it based on what we expect it to do with a little bit of pessimism mixed in. So we're like, oh, we're gonna play a 3-3 unit. Uh, if it gets removed, that's fine. It, you know, like does its particular thing and it measures up pretty well against all of the other units on that field. Uh, we don't say that because a 3-3 unit dies to Torch, uh, it is just a bad unit. Uh, we generally say that like we want 3-3 units because they are consistently pretty good, and when they do die to Torch, oh, that's, that's kind of a little bit rough. Uh, draft tier lists are lists of expected values. So if you're looking at a list of draft cards and you're seeing the A's and the S's, those are the cards where like, whenever they're put down, we really expect them to perform well. Big flyers will almost always get in for lots of damage. They'll often push to win the game. They'll do a lot of those types of things really easily. Intrepid Longhorn, the 3-3 three, three for 2, just behaves really, really well in a draft environment. Some of that is also based on the meta. So for example, like a card like Combray Stranger is a reasonably strong card in draft. It fixes your colors, which is really, really important in draft. Fixing is just very high value in general. It's got an okay stat line and it's colorless, so it's easy to play even if you aren't necessarily in those colors. Oh, that leads to being like a relatively reliable card with a, a reasonable expected value. But like because strangers are really strong in the current draft format, uh, which is Echoes of Eternity, we have the ability to sort of play these strangers and expect them to do even more. Like this stranger is pretty likely to get played into another stranger that allows it to draw treasure troves, or a card like Magnificent Stranger that allows you to put discounts down. Um, basically, it allows you to sort of play around with a bunch of other strangers because there are a lot of other strangers in the draft format. So as a result, like you value these cards a little bit higher because not only are they buffed by your strangers, they're also buffed by your opponent's strangers. And there's so many strangers that people can't really not pick strangers. So yeah, it's important to have a lot of strangers at the moment. And like, this is a kind of thing where you get a little bit of extra value out of those cards. Basically based on the meta, that also changes what our general expected value is. Um, so if strangers are strong, then you're happier to take a card like this over even other cards that might be uh, otherwise taken in a different format. Depending on what's in the packs, the expected value changes, and so do your tier lists. However, here's the thing about tier lists. Expected value changes not only based off of what's in the set, but also about the choices that you're making in a draft. So while a card like Nivea's Inquisitor has really low expected value, it is just a 2-2, two, two. it doesn't do anything too crazy, it's pretty weak on stats, and it's in green, so we have to actually uh, have that filter up. Uh, but like, in general, if you don't have the ability to decimate, this card is not super strong. And that's kind of relevant, um, but if you have a card like Draw Strength, if you just picked one of those, then Nivea's Inquisitor looks a lot stronger, because you have a decimate card, the more decimate cards that you have, the better Nivea's Inquisitor looks, since it gets a straight up plus two plus two buff at fast spell speed whenever you play a card like Draw Strength. If you have three or four of them, Nivea's Inquisitor is probably going to be an absolute bomb that rules the board and has to be removed or else it'll turn into a very, very large unit that kind of crushes your opponent. If you're running cards like Reconnaissance, that card gets even more scary. Uh, if you have like other Decimate effects, if you have ways to buff Decimate effects like Elos' Elite so that Decimate doesn't damage the rest of your deck, then yeah, Nivea's Nivea's Inquisitor is an even higher pick. Uh, once you are sort of committing to a couple of choices, this card's expected value rises. And that's sort of where we come into the potential value aspect. So how does all this all weigh out? In general, uh, this kind of is important information to know, but it's not always as relevant as you would expect. It's good practice to pick the best card each pack, pretty much no matter what you're doing. Fill out all the things that you need in a deck, like you need to have a certain number of two drops, you need to have some removal, you need to have something that will carry the game to victory that gives you the reach to deal damage to your opponent or mill out your opponent or whatever it is that your strategy is going to be. Picking cards to fit your deck style and to fit basically what you've seen is where your highest chance of success lies. However, if you're not afraid of failure, you can also 
bet the farm, you can pursue cards with very, very high potential value and do whatever you can to make that potential value their expected value. You can do stuff like pick Anivia's Inquisitor first, which I wouldn't recommend because the expected value of this is still not that great. And then you can start doing whatever you can to like pick up as many decimate effects as you can and just try to sort of like go into a situation where you have a lot of cards with high expected value that are all working very well together and that synergy will then sort of exceed the sort of good card piles that other people are playing. The risk of this is really high, you'll fall flat on your face most of the time, but when you do succeed that's often where you'll find a 7-0 list and they're pretty fun to play if you actually get them all together. So. If you're playing like a really bad draft, sometimes you can end up with a really good one, which is a definite risk reward thing that is something to pay attention to. Uh, most of the time, if you're gonna run into a list like this, you're gonna do it just by following regular signals, however. You pick good cards, and then maybe you pick something up that's a little bit strange, and then maybe your next pick fits that card really, really well, and then your next pick pick fits that card really well, and so on and so forth. So for example, we put up a draft a couple months ago, I think, a month or two ago, uh, from the previous set where we just somehow in the middle of like pack two picked up six, seven wizened crones, and we just got uh, a ton of them. And that was pretty wild. Like they're, they weren't a very strong card in general. Like people were picking them very low. They didn't have high expected value because they didn't usually do enough. They're pretty weak on stats. And uh, we'll just pull up Wizen Crown here so you can see it. But the spell damage provided by Wizen Crown was definitely not doing enough to sort of offset the fact that the card had pretty weak stats and was in Skycrag, which had pretty weak cards. So it wasn't particularly strong in the meta. But like at, we were in those colors and we picked up a Wizen Crone because there wasn't much else available. And then we found another one. And then the third one was just much higher value for us at that point when we saw it. And then we got a fourth one and a fifth one. And immediately I said, so anything that does spell damage right now is priority one. <laughs> like Breath of Voprex is good at this point. That ended up being one of our uh, seven win decks. I don't remember if it was a 7-0 or not, but we ended up with six Wizen Crones, two Breaths, a couple of Hot Blood Barbarians, the whole shebang. I expected Breath of Voprex to do damage to face because if you're doing eight to nine damage to face, that's a thing that really, really hurts when the rest of your deck is like also aggressive charge stuff. Obviously not doing anything about that. <laughs> God, I love it. Eight. Not a lot of love there. Alright, you ready? Breath of Oprex for the win. <laughs> it's correct to lose the uh, combustion roller here so you don't immediately lose the game. <laughs> So the main lesson I want to take away here for both draft and general deck building, your cards are worth more based on the cards that you already have. So learn to understand the difference between expected value and potential value, and keep an eye out for what it is that helps your F minus cards become A pluses. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, my name is Pojo, and uh, as always, you can find me on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and Patreon. I will see you all next time. Have a lovely evening, and I hope this helped at least a little bit. Cheers.